thanks to the Thais team for inviting me. Um, I'm very fond of Thais. Um, I, I think it was 10 years ago when I had, uh, when I attended a Thais meeting in Alaska in Anchorage. Uh, it was such a great meeting and, and that's where I think I got the drive to work in environmental statistics and I've never looked back since really. So um, I'm from the University of Wollongong in Australia. Uh, Wollongong is a, is a beautiful uh, seaside city just south of Sydney, um, 80 kilometers south of Sydney. So if anybody is ever in Australia, um, down under and you know wants to visit, we're, we're very welcoming and we're always happy to have a chat. So um, the, the talk title, Bayesian Inference on Carbon Dioxide Surface Fluxes Using Satellite Data, um, is uh, self, um, self-explanatory, I think, but I'll, I'll talk you know, a lot about the, the individual terms which appear in the titles throughout the talk. Um, this presentation was done in collaboration with Michael and Michael Bertolacci, who's a postdoc uh, here at NIASRA, um, and also Noel Cressy. And uh, there, are, there are many more members involved. I'll talk briefly about that later. All right, so the, the main topic of this uh, talk is, is the wombat. Um, <laughs> uh, of course, we won't be talking about the animal, the wombat, uh, but the acronym WOMBAT, which stands for Wollongong Methodology for Basin Assimilation of Trace Gases, is the main focus of this talk. Um, so, so the wombat, the animal, is a, is a very cute animal here in Australia, and uh, I like to call it the teddy bear of the Southern Hemisphere because they're just so cute, and you, you, that's what you have as a soft toy, not, not a teddy bear here. Um, right, so WO is, is, um, is for Wollongong, uh, M is methodology, and BAT is for Bayesian assimilation of trace gases. So I'll be talking about a Bayesian hierarchical uh, framework. Um, Assimilation, it's because I will be talking about the, the fusion of numerical model output, in this case, a chemical transport model, the output from a chemical transport model with some observational data, in this case, satellite data. And we are focused on, on trace gases. So, so a trace gas is any gas in the atmosphere apart from the big three. The big three are um, oxygen, nitrogen, and argon. Uh, the any anything else, which is the last 0.1% of the atmosphere, is a trace gas, or is made up of trace gases. Now, uh, we are mostly interested in that 0.1%. That's where you find carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides, CFCs. Um, so a lot of work goes to try and see what's happening to that 0.1% of our atmosphere. So um, many people were involved are involved in this project, which um, I really started working on together with Noel Cressy about six years ago now. Um, so this is myself um, in statistics, our postdoc Michael Bertolacci in statistics, and, and Noel Cressy in statistics. But um, lots we had lots of inputs from from atmospheric chemists, including Jenny Fisher here at Wollongong, uh, Matrick B at Bristol, and Stavert at CSIRO. Which when we started the project, she was at Bristol as well. Um, Yi Chao on the IT side. And we had lots of you know, conversations with many other people from the satellite OCO2 flux group. Um, they gave us a lot of input and also I list some names here also who we've had some very important discussions with. They're all atmospheric chemists um, over the years in order. Um, and this all helped bring us to the stage where we are at today. So uh, why is this framework um, important? Um, so uh, Wombat um, will soon be part of an international model intercomparison project, uh, which involves researchers from all around the world, um, including NASA and NOAA, uh, and others from other science institutions and universities. So there are about 13 to 16 groups around the world who try to use satellite data to find carbon dioxide sink, sinks and sources uh, from the satellite data. Okay, And, and we count ourselves as, as one of those groups at the moment. Um, and also next year, Wombat uh, will contribute to a report that will be submitted to the United Nations Global Stock Take. Um, this meeting, which will happen in, in 2023, is, is really to um, see where countries are in tracking their, their carbon dioxide emissions to see whether they are on track or not, uh, things like that. Now, countries are self-accountable to report their, their emissions. So, so they estimate their emissions by you know, estimating the number of cars they have, um, how much wood they are burning, uh, you know, the power stations, what are they emitting, uh, th things like that. Um, and uh, that's what we call a bottom-up approach, um, trying to go to the basics and building up. And that can lead to um, 
significant uncertainties uh, when aggregating, especially over large areas. Uh, what we're doing is the reverse. We call this a top-down approach, where we see what the satellite data is, what's, what's carbon dioxide doing in the atmosphere, and then try to go backwards in time, essentially, and see where the carbon dioxide came from or where it went. Um, and that's actually a, a much harder problem, mathematically at least, um, but it gives you a much more objective assessment of what um, the real state of the net carbon emissions is across the world. Um, so um, why is uh, carbon dioxide um, an important gas? Um, so I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, every time I see this uh, graph of you know the, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which, which we measure in units of parts per million. So you take a million uh, molecules and you see how many of those are carbon dioxide, basically. Um, you know, it's just, it's just increase and, and the increase is, is so, so dramatic um, over such a relatively short amount of time. It is worrying, um, even if, you know, we didn't know what this gas does in the atmosphere, which we do know, uh, it would still be worrying because this is a massive increase. Okay, it's like a 30, 40% increase in 60 years. Um, now, we, and we know um, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It will cause, um, and it is causing um, global warming. Um, and the, what the worrying thing is that, you know, even if we, if we keep our net carbon emissions um, to be the same, this, at the moment, we'll still get an increase, right? So, well, we actually need to get a net zero in order for this to remain constant. And then we need a net decrease in order for this to start going down. So. Um, it is a global problem and, and one which uh, is, is actually very, of course, very difficult to, to solve. Um, so why is um, this uh, flux inversion problem, which is in looking at data from satellites on carbon dioxide and trying to see, you know, where it came from and, you know, what, what countries are doing? Why is it such a difficult problem? And uh, the reason is that uh, once carbon dioxide is emitted, it mixes very quickly in the atmosphere. So you're going to emit it today and in uh, you know, 15 days time. So what we've done here is we've, we've switched on the US and we've, we've assumed the rest of the world is off, not emitting anything. And then we've seen the effect of the gas, like what does the gas do in the atmosphere? And okay, in the first day, there's not much. It's mostly in the United States. And then it starts swirling around this is 15 January now. By the 1st of February, it's basically all across the Northern Hemisphere. And by the mid of February, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, the, the Northern Hemisphere is nearly constant. Um, it's not, but it's nearly constant. The more fraction there. So if I observe something today, uh, I need to actually go backwards in time and see where it came from. And it's, it's actually a very complicated problem. So I'm going to share my screen now and uh, show, show you a video. Um, of what this looks like in practice. So, so this is exactly what I've talked about. We are switching on the US emissions for one month and then we're switching them off. So the cumulative emissions will flatten in February. And then we see what the gas does. The gas doesn't just disappear, right? It's just, it's going to be swirling around in the atmosphere. Okay, so we've switched on the United States. It's emitting carbon dioxide. And in February, we're soon going to switch the United States off as well. So now there are no emissions across the globe, but the gas still is still there and it's still going around. Um, so our satellites are retrieving um, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. But, you know, we're in February now and, you know, we've got about a quarter of a ppm in the northern hemisphere. And it's not just the United States, which is emitting the gas, all right? There's every country in the world is emitting uh, carbon dioxide. And of course, there are natural sources and sinks as well. Um, and not only in January, in February, in March, in April, in May. So what we get is this big confusion of contributions, let's put it that way, to when, when we observe how much parts per million there is at this point in space and this point in time, it's very hard to say exactly where this came from and when it came. So that is why this problem is often known as a nil post problem. Okay, mathematically, it's a nil post problem. Um, I'm going to go back to my previous slides. Um, so the efforts to reduce net carbon dioxide emissions must be uh, global. Um, 
and uh, we need to know you know where the emissions are where the sinks are and uh, and you know the strength of the emissions and the sinks and you, you think that by now we know we really have a good understanding on you know what, what regions are the biggest sinks of carbon dioxide which are the sources um, but actually there's lots and lots of uncertainty still around um, you know the extent to which oceans are sink of sinks of carbon dioxide um, you know the, the what's happening in the extra tropics uh, we have this big seasonal cycle which we'll see a lot later in the talk um, you know exactly how much is the biosphere absorbing um, carbon dioxide so the biosphere is fortunately for us and it's sink um, but we are emitting much more than what the biosphere is absorbing all right so let's uh, let's start talking about the the main model in wombat so uh, we're going to have what we call a multivariate uh, spatial temporal process um, because we have two two spatial temporal processes of interest here um, the first one is what we are primarily interested in okay this is the, called the flux field so these are um, the sources and sinks of, of carbon dioxide, and those are measured in kilogram per meter squared per year. Um, and what we've done here is simply taken a plausible um, flux field, and I'll say how we uh, describe how we come up with a plausible field later, um, and just averaged it for a whole month. Okay, so, so and this is January, so you can see that, um, for example, the northern extra tropics, uh, all the trees have lost their leaves mostly, so they're, they're not really. Um, um, absorbing carbon dioxide, there's, there's not a lot of sun during the year, during the, these months, sorry. So, so actually you have a net sink over here. In, in summer, um, this will become a net source, okay, of, of, sorry, this will become a net sink of, of carbon dioxide. But what we observe is not this, okay, what we observe is the, the carbon dioxide mole fraction in the atmosphere. So this is the emissions that have gone up in the atmosphere, they're swirling around. Uh, and this is an example of a mole fraction field um, column averaged. Okay, so imagine I'm looking at it from space and I'm just taking an average at every spatial location um, over three hours at midnight in January, 2016, first of January, 2016. Okay. And this will change every, you know, every 20 minutes. We simulated a 20 minute resolution. Actually, this, this field changes um, quite, quite quickly. Um, and again, so we want to go from this to this. But the problem is even more difficult than that because we don't observe this. We, we can't observe the whole earth at one point in time everywhere. That's, it's just impossible, right? We've got satellites and ground stations, but what we observe is, is more something like this. Okay? So Z2 um, is, the, is the observations of what I call Y2, which is the mole fraction field. Okay? And the Y2 is actually a three-dimensional space-time field. Okay? So space height, that's a geopotential height, um, and uh, T would be the, the time, um, UTC. Um, but what we observe is actually this thing over here. Okay. So this is data from the OCO2 satellite, um, Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 satellite. Um, it's, um, it's in a sun-synchronous orbit, uh, which means that when it's going round, it's always roughly around midday um, local time, wherever it is. And uh, it's got a 16 day uh, repeat cycle, which means it's going around the earth. And after 16 days, it will start overlapping its uh, previous tracks. Um, these are called tracks. OK, so, so it's, you can imagine it's going around the earth and it's taking soundings. And uh, what we get are um, mole fractions in parts per million. Um, very close, sometimes directly under the satellite, sometimes slightly off, where we call that the glint mode. Um, but, but those are details. Um, and, and what we observe is something like this. Um, now, the, the satellite actually retrieves carbon dioxide in the vertical dimension as well, but um, those are very unreliable. So what we end up doing is using a column average, the pressure weighted average of the carbon dioxide in a vertical column as our data, okay. and, uh, and I'll talk more about that um, later. So the Bayesian hierarchical framework um, is, looks something like this. So we've got the satellite, which is, this is a picture of the OCO2 satellite. It's giving us this data. Okay, It's a spatial temporal data set, uh, quite big, um, hundreds of thousands of data points for the study we consider. Um, 
So Z2i, so each measurement would be a column average. This is a column averaging operator, AI, of the mole fraction field um, at some point in space, at some point in time. Um, the height here is averaged over. That's why I've done a dot. We know that the retrievals from the satellite are biased. Um, so we're going to add a bias term over here. And we also know that there's some random error. Um, and we call that measurement error. Okay, so that the epsilon i would just say it's normally distributed at some variance. Um, I, I should say that <laughs> this AI over here is itself an inversion algorithm. Okay, so the OCO2 satellite reads um, spectra. Okay, so it looks at the light spectra. What the way it works is that uh, gases like carbon dioxide have got very um, a very clear um, absorption signatures in spectral space. So you take a spectrum and if you see some frequencies which are greatly attenuated, then that is related to how much um, carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere just below the satellite. So, um, so but going from spectral space to actual PPM, there's, there's quite a long process. It's an inversion algorithm. It's also a Bayesian inversion algorithm. Um, but we're going to take those, actually the maximum a posteriori estimates from that Bayesian inversion algorithm as our data. All right, so um, that's the data model, what I call the data model. But Y2, uh, which is the more fraction field, now this is over the whole globe. Um, we need a model for that. And that is actually the transported flux. Uh, so we've got this linear operator on the flux. Um, we're using G because it's related to the Green's function of a, of a PDE. Uh, but just think of this as having some flux here, which we're denoting as Y1. These are the sources and sinks. We're going to transport them to the atmosphere, and that is going to give us the mole fraction Y2. Um, of course, chemical transport models are not um, um, you know, they're, they're not perfect. There, there are some errors, um, mostly due to, to grid-based approximations, but also due to not getting the physics exactly right. Um, so, so we've also got this uh, spatial temporal um, um, error term here, which we call a uh, transport error. But of course, the, the, the long-term goal is to estimate Y1. Uh, we're not that interested in Y2, okay? It's really the fluxes. Um, so how, how do we go about that? Um, we need a model for Y1. Okay? Now, the flux field, um, if we had to model it at the grid, grid level, so let's say we didn't care about computations and we just went for the finest resolution possible, okay, which is that of the chemical transport model. We are constrained by that. So the finest resolution we can go to um, realistically is about 2 degrees by 2.5 degrees. Um, and that is about, and let's say we want a daily resolution, that's about uh, 314,000 you know, flux grid cells per day that we would need to make inference on. Um, we actually want to make um, inference on, on two years um, of data, two years of fluxes actually. Um, so if we multiplied this by 365 by two, we get roughly 220 million um, unknowns. And, and that is, of course, uh, way too much. Um, nowadays, you probably can fit that um, spacious stats models to to that um, of, of that of that dimension if you used various approximations. Um, but uh, really, within this hierarchical model, it would be impossible to to make inference at that um, at that resolution. Nearly impossible. All right. So what we what we opted for is to instead assume. Uh, uh, low dimensional representation of the flux field. So what we're going to say is that Y1, which is the flux, is some, um, some best estimate of the flux before we do the inversion. And we get those that best estimate from databases like um, you know, what the biosphere is doing, what, what were the fires, you know, the forest fires and, and all that stuff. But I'll mention those briefly later to come up, to come up with a good initial estimate of Y1 naught. And then we're going to use basis functions. Um, and those basis functions are also physically motivated. They're not just, you know, um, sometimes we do splines or they're based on splines or bi squares or Wendland basis functions. No, they are, they are actually physically motivated basis functions, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then we're going to weight those basis functions by alpha um, ij. So what is i and j here? i denotes um, 
a spatial scope of the basis function and j denotes a time point. Um, so in fact, what we're going to do is divide the world into various spatial regions um, and consider a monthly resolution. So, so our, we'll only be updating these, these basis functions will have a monthly scope. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to update the alpha j's. And you can think of these alpha j's as adjustments to uh, as causing an adjustment to our initial best guess of the flux y1 naught. Now, these alpha ij's um, are themselves random, okay? We're going to model them using simple uh, motor regressive one processes. Um, and the reason for that is because if our best guess, let's say, is wrong, let's say it's too low in January, it's probably going to be wrong as well by a similar amount in February. So, so that is the intuition as to why having these uh, scalings uh, correlated in time. That's why we do that. Okay, so we have a sigma squared i here, uh, which is also unknown, and also a rho i here, which is also unknown, and then we would put priors on those. All right, so these are the spatial regions, um, which I was talking about. Um, uh, again, this, this comes from the atmospheric chemistry literature, why it is reasonable to split up the world into these regions when it comes to carbon dioxide. Um, they're called transcom regions, um, and there are 22 of them. Um, now, does this figure might give you the impression that we are considering basis functions that are constant uh, within each region, but that's not the case. So every basis function will be spatial temporally varying within each region. Okay? And the, the pattern, let's put it that way, of the spatial temporal variation comes from inventories and the databases. Um, all right, so, so this gives us actually the full hierarchical model excluding the hyper prior. So I'm not, I'm not talking about the hyper priors, you know, like a, a beta prior on the, on the autoregressive parameter, but this, this is the main, uh, the main hierarchical model in, in Wombat. So we've got, just to recap, we've got data taking a column average of the mole fraction field with bias terms and some random me measurement component. Um, the mole fraction field is a transported flux plus some transport error. The flux has some flux prior mean. Uh, this will be the mean because we'll take the expectation of the alphas to be zero. Um, and then we're going to have some, this will cause the flux adjustment. Okay? So inference on the alpha is really our main target here because that is what will give us inferences on the Y1, just the flux. And then we've got the alpha IJs are following autoregressive one processes. Um, we have one for every spatial temporal region. And then we've got these, uh, these residuals um, from the AR1 are modeled as a zero with a variance sigma squared i, which we assume, um, are, so the sigma squared i is per spatial region, okay? It does not change in time. Um, the, the importance of using basis functions is that you know, we, we initially had 220 million unknowns, but if we use 22 transcoms and one monthly resolution, then over two years, you get 692 unknowns. Okay? So we've reduced the dimensionality of our problem uh, dramatically. Okay? Um, of course, this, this, there's no free lunch. There are drawbacks to doing this, which, which we can discuss later. Um, but, but this is essentially uh, how we go around tackling our dimension, problem of dimensionality. Now, recall that the mole fraction field Y2 um, is given by, by this equation over here. If we do a mental substitution of Y1 here, which is this quantity over here, and substitute it into this equation um, over here, and we interchange the integration and summation, we get this model for Y2. Um, Y2 naught would simply be the transported best guess flux, okay, of our prior expectation, essentially, and that will give us y two naught, which we can think of as our now our best guess uh, mode fraction field, and uh, and now these we're going to have the integration of uh, g with the basis functions phi, and that's going to give us a new basis function. It's called as psi. Um, but now psi is in the mole fraction space, okay? So there's space, height, and time. Um, I'll talk more about psi later. The, the interesting to note is that we've got our alphas, they propagate through, okay? They jump out of the integration. Um, 
So although now this model is in mode fraction space, when we make inference on the alphas, we would implicitly be making inference on the flux field as well, okay? Because y1 is um, determined by alpha. Um, now this is uh, just a big um, vector vector product actually. So we can write this equation more succinctly as follows, and we need to make inference on this alpha. So the, the, these psi ij's, um, if, if you recall when we did that mental substitution, essentially they're, they're the transported flux basis functions. Um, that's what they turn out to be. Um, these are sometimes referred to as response functions in, them in the literature. Um, and well, how, how do we come up with these, uh, with these response functions? Well, to, we can't analytically do this. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the chemical transport is, is really complicated. It's determined by meteorological fields, which are changing all the time. Um, so, so how do we determine these basis functions? Well, we actually evaluate them at any point in space and time that we want using a chemical transport model. And how we do we do that? Well, we, we take our basis function, like what I showed you earlier in the video, which would have some local spatial scope and some local temporal scope, um, and literally pass those through a transport model. And that will give us the what we call the response function, which is the basis function in mode fraction space. Um, and this is where we start now hitting some computational issues because running a, a chemical transport model is not simple in itself. I mean, first of all, we, we use JSCAM, it's written in Fortran. Um, it's, it's, a, it's own beast of a software in order to get working. Um, you need know, to get inventories, databases, all with different formats. Um, but, but, there's, but also it takes a long time. So if we want to take one basis function and simulate it forward for two years, um, uh, we, we simulate at a 20 minute resolution uh, and you cannot, cannot really go much below that um, and also at a grid cell level so it will take you know many hours uh, even maybe a couple of days to to simulate one basis function forward um, and we need we need to do that for every basis function okay so so we will have 693 uh, runs that we need to do um, in a later version of Wombat, which we're working on at the moment, we've got an order of magnitude more basis functions. It's nothing you can't do on a supercomputer, okay? But this, this is what makes uh, development slow sometimes if there's a mistake uh, or you realize something's wrong. I mean, you need to go back to the drawing board, rerun all those things. So uh, development can be a bit slow in this area. Um, so this is what, uh, similar to the video I, sh I showed you before, you have the flux basis function, you transport it using JOSCAM forward in time, and this is what a spatial temporal response function would look like, okay? So it's, let's say we're considering a basis function, this would be our flux basis function, by the way, um, in January 2016. Um, so the basis, the response function will have, you know, a bit of carbon dioxide here. Um, concentrated over you know, the whole um, North America and by the middle of January, and then it's really spread across the Northern Hemisphere by mid-Feb, uh, March. It takes a couple of years for, for this mode fraction to cover the whole globe. Okay? The inter-hemispheric mixing tends to be quite slow. Um, right, and those are our response functions, and we've got 700 of them, and they are three-dimensional space-time, okay? So there's space, height, and time. Um, so now we can substitute our model for Y2 in our data model. Uh, and actually we get a data model, uh, which is, I mean, at the end of the day, this is linear Gaussian, really, you know, standard stuff, but I hope you appreciate the complexity in, in, in getting this, this basic linear Gaussian model. Um, so we've got, um, uh, an averaging of the mode fraction field, uh, which is of our best guess, plus the response functions multiplied by the weights. And remember that the weights are our target, our inferential target. We've got the, the transport model error here, which ultimately what we're going to do is simply model as a spatial temporal um, field, okay, um, using approximations in the likelihood. I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, and then we've got some biases and then we've got some random errors. Okay. Um, 
So what do we need to make inference on? Of course, the alphas, those give us the fluxes, the betas, those are the bias correction coefficients. Um, v nu2 here, um, the transport model, we're going to make inference on like spatial length scales and temporal length scales coming from the transport model. Um, and epsilon would be the variance of our measurement error. Um, now, the retrieval, the OCO2 retrieval actually gives us measurement errors, but we don't really trust them. So what we, what we do is we introduce an inflation factor for those variances and we estimate those, in, those you know, inflation factors as well. Okay, so we, we're going to use a Markov chain Monte Carlo. I'm not going to, to talk about the details. Um, we have a paper in GMD, which, which talks about all of this now. Um, but uh, essentially, um, there's a, there's a Gip, the Gibbs sampling based framework. There's some slice sampling in there, some Metropolis Hastings, but nothing, um, you know, nothing particularly extraordinary from an MCMC point of view. But the, the biggest, the bigger challenge is, of course, is showing that you've got good mixing, that you've converged to the correct distribution. So um, Michael had produce you know these plots with hundreds of trace plots and we looked at all of them actually um, to really ensure that um, all our parameters in our model are mixing well. Um, the spatial temporal correlation component which is this new tool over here um, that's ultimately that we have hundreds of thousands of data points um, we, we do use vecchia approximations um, essentially what these are is you break down a joint distribution into a product of conditionals uh, and then when the the set of conditionals becomes really large you start removing some of those um, things you are conditioning on uh, that gives you some sparse matrices and um, things become a bit easier to work with um, we have to use um, GPUs simply because there are lots of matrix calculations um, and uh, GPUs really helped us in getting some of those true. Um, and yeah, and then you just get posterior distributions on all your unknowns. Um, so um, that's it basically. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to show you quickly um, the last 10 minutes, uh, some, some results uh, that we got. So what we tried to do with Wombat is replicate the Model Intercomparison Project V7, um, which was published in 2019. Uh, so we were working on one bet, but it wasn't really ready uh, by, by the time they were doing the MIP, so we didn't take part. But what we did is, is still try to take part after the fact, let's put it that way. So we used their protocol um, using data from September 2014 to March 2017 average the satellite data to 10 seconds. That was their choice. We're still not sure whether this is really a necessary step. We use JS, uh, JSCAM, we use the JSFP meteorology. You can use different meteorology uh, that would probably give you different results. This is one of the problems with flux inversion. There, there are many moving parts. Um, then you need to have these databases. Um, I think I mentioned these earlier to construct your basis functions, but also to construct your best guess flux to start off with. Um, so this is, of course, a lot of work in itself, finding these databases, so these fossil fuel databases, ocean fluxes databases, um, biosphere fluxes. So what is the biosphere doing? This is probably one of the most important. Um, so what are the trees doing? Absorbing carbon dioxide, um, for example, animals, everything. Okay, there are models for that. So these biosphere fluxes. Biofuel fluxes, these would be um, uh, things like uh, wood fuel, um, so there are databases for that and also biomass burning, for example, of this QFED, uh, it's the fire emissions database. Uh, these track uh, forest fires, um, which emit uh, carbon monoxide, which eventually becomes carbon dioxide. So um, all, all of these have to be included in order for this framework to work. So why is uh, Wombat different? Um, I didn't really talk about that. So of course, there are lots of flux inversion systems around the world and uh, they, they all kind of work um, but what they don't do is for example incorporate the bias terms in the model they don't consider spatial temporally correlated error terms they don't consider um, uncertainty on the priors parameters things like that um, basically everything is done so that the system remains gaussian gaussian um, and, and at a relatively tractable dimensionality um, and that comes with a lot of compromises. And, and what we've tried to do is uh, develop a framework which can, you know, not 
you know, force us to make those compromises to just have a Gaussian Gaussian model marginally. Um, of course, conditionally, it's still Gaussian Gaussian, but there are lots of other moving parts in the model. So what we did was a, an OSI. Um, these are called an observation system simulation experiment. And what you do here is you simulate um, pseudo data, so OCO2 data, uh, using a working model. Um, and this working model is going to include biases and spatial temporal correlations in our case. And then we're going to see what happens when we remove those biases in our model and we remove those, um, those correlated errors in our model. Okay. So, so this is the model that we're going to generate data from. It's ex exactly what I showed you before. There's some spatial temporal error term here. There's also some, some biases. These biases are again physically motivated. Um, we know that uh, the OCO2 data is biased um, when the retrieved surface pressure is lower or higher. Um, um, uh, sorry, it's, uh, the bias is a function of the retrieved surface pressure, the, um, the carbon dioxide of the surface, at, um, the pressure, uh, the air pressure, the aerosol optical depth, all these things. Uh, there are others, but these are the main ones. So, so we actually generated synthetic data and incorporated these biases in. We also used some spatial temporal correlation, and then we, we played a game where we either left them out in our model or put them in. And this is this is quite a quite a difficult plot to to interpret in the short amount of time we have. Um, these are called uh, diver down plots. Um, this is, uh, I think it's because if it's like following the trajectory of a, of a diver who, who who is diving. But um, diver down plots are, are used quite a lot in the space because there usually is a reasonable understanding of what total flux is. So, for example. Here we're comparing flux in the southern tropics to flux in the northern tropics, and you know, and, and all inferences would generally follow this straight this line because the total is easy to constrain. It's as it's partitioning that total up into different components, which is very difficult. Um, and what we show here is what happens when we, for example, remove uh, correlation or remove biases in our models. And to cut a long story short. Uh, if you focus on this uh, green one here, this is when we have no bias correction and no correlated errors assumed in our model, uh, when the truth is in fact biased and has correlated errors. And the truth here, the true flux is given by the triangle, okay? Um, and you can see that this is uh, way off when you assume there's no correlation or biases. The, the red is when you do assume correlation and biases, and you can see that you know, for 2015 and 2016, the red, the, the true value sits very nicely in, in the red ellipse. Um, and that is, uh, the ellipse is given by 95% credible intervals. Um, you, can, you, you can see that it sits quite nicely in there. Uh, that's to be expected because it would be the true model at that point. Uh, what is quite interesting is the, the purple one. Uh, this is when you have no bias correction in your model, but you have assumed that there are correlated errors. And, and you can see that it's off, but the credible intervals have widened up. Um, so what that shows us is that if you are not as, if, you, if you're not assuming any biases, the incorporation of spatial temp, a spatial temporal error term in your model can save you a bit. Uh, what has happened here is that probably it has attributed a very long length scale to the spatial temporal error term that reduces the amount of effective information you have on the flux. That's why we get larger. Um, credible intervals, but but actually, you know, things look um, quite well. Maybe, maybe here and here they're missed, but at least in in um, 2015, 2016, for uh, the satellite mode, which is land glint, the true value is in the ellipse. Anyway, we can play this game, and uh, it was clear from our results that, of course, if the data is really biased and has correlated errors, then if you don't assume them in the model, you are in uh, you have problems. All right, so um, then we looked at the real data, of course. Um, again, lots, lots of plots, um, which, which are hard to interpret in the short amount of time we have. But um, what we have here is that the light green is, are the results from the model intercomparison project, which is the spread, OK? So this is the minimum and maximum. And we have 2015, 2016. These lines are the prior expectations. We can ignore them. 
for now. Um, and the, the dark green then is our posterior distribution. So we're, we're comparing apples with oranges a bit because this is the spread of point estimates from you know, 13 groups around the world. And this is our posterior distribution. Um, and this is really just a sanity check to see that whether our framework is giving us reasonable inferences or not. Um, it's hard to know just by looking at these plots, you know, whether we're you know, better or worse or, or whatever. Um, so, but, but, but these plots really show us, and even here we've got zone estimates, so northern extra tropics, northern tropics. Um, there are some, some you, you might call them issues, for example, here in the northern tropics, um, which, uh, which actually have, have improved a lot in, in version two. We have changed the model slightly. Um, but that's a story for another time. Um, okay, uh, we can estimate the bias coefficients online. This is a big strength of our approach. So what is usually done is uh, people use um, what we call TCON data, which is total um, column carbon observing network data for estimating the biases in the satellite data. So, so they, these are ground station data, they compare them to satellite data and they come up with these uh, bias coefficients. Um, but what we can actually do is estimate them online while doing flux inversion, okay? And this is um, something uh, relatively new. Um, and uh, what we can see, there are two modes of satellite da uh, data. So this is land glint data, this is land nadar data. Doesn't really matter. Um, our posterior distributions don't really capture what, you know, the group's estimate of the bias is um, perfectly, um, but you can see that we're in, a, in the vicinity of their estimate. Um, uh, you know, very, it's quite remarkable that we can do this during an, a flux inversion process. Also, um, their estimate is only based on data at the TCON stations, while our estimate is based on the OCO2 data, which is everywhere um, in space and time, right? So their estimate is not necessarily you know, as reliable as ours or vice versa, we just don't know. Um, but it's really reassuring to see that at least we are in the same ballpark. And finally, validation, um, and I'll conclude with this. Um, validation is very difficult in the flux inversion world because we cannot get real, um, you know, uh, ground truth observations of the flux on the scales of things like countries. It's, it's impossible. So what we do is we get those fluxes and then we simulate forward using a transport model and then compare them to ground station data, or in this case, the TCO data, and see what the errors are okay, in the mean squared errors. Um, so it's kind of a proxy way of validating your flux. Um, and here we are comparing to the other groups. Um, is, um, so land glint, which is the first inversion using land glint data. Um, we actually got an RMSC of 1.19 at the, sorry, uh, mean squared error, not root mean squared error, just mean squared error of 1.19. Um, and that was better than actually every other group um, which, uh, which did flux inversion. Uh, for the land nadar, uh, we got 1.57. Um, that is uh, a bit higher. So, so I think we're about four out of 10 people um, to get um, use, using this metric, okay, of mean squared error at validation um, data location. So these data weren't used in the inversion. All right, so I'd like to um, conclude there. Um, we are still working on Wombat. Um, we're working on a Wombat V2 project, which um, you know models the climatology of the fluxes. That is our biggest uh, change, but also splits the biosphere component into uh, respiration and gross primary production. Uh, so it allows us to see which components are really contributing to uh, to the net biosphere exchange that we that we see. Um, okay, I'm, I'd like to, to conclude there. There are some references. Anybody who wants the, the slides, um, I'll be happy to share them. Thank you.